Welcome to the Naked Podcaster. Get ready to hear the story of someone strong enough to bear it all. The Naked Podcaster is a representation of freeing yourself, giving you permission to be real in all your quirkiness, baggage, struggles to success, and tragedy to triumph. I'm so excited you're joining the journey. Your past doesn't define you, but it does lead you on a path to today. Let's get naked. Hello and welcome to the Naked Podcaster. This is Jen Taylor, and today I am here with Jamie Holloway. Jamie, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. I like your background wall. <laughs> <laughs> you got the window, so it's super bright coming in behind uh, me. But Yeah, and then this wood accent wall. It's great. I don't use the video for the podcast, but podcasters, because we're on video, a lot of the time we're always scoping people's situations out. So I like your wall. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I love it. Yeah. So we're going to talk about what you're doing right now. You have a website called Just Do You. And actually, it's as easy as it sounds. Um, It's a blog and uh, information about you. So let's dive in and tell me what you're doing right now. So right now, I have so much on my plate. Oh, my gosh. I just have a lot going on. Um, So I'll kind of give a brief description of everything that I have going. So my husband and I work from home. We have a company called Elite Content Marketing, and we market podcasts. (laughs) <laughs> See, nobody Your has reaction is like so cute. <laughs> uh, nobody, because I was silent, <laughs> but I was very excited. Okay, okay, go ahead. Keep going, yeah. keep going. So we do that um, full time and we're just working on, biz, you know, building our business and gaining clients. But, you know, because we market other people's podcasts, um, it just was a natural fit for us to have our own podcast. And originally, our, my podcast was called Creating Love Together. And it was something that my husband and I did together. Um, because in our past, we've both been divorced and not the best of situations. So we wanted to share with other people how to have the best relationship possible. So it was Creating Love Together. But then as we went along, it kind of started being more about... Um, like connecting with women. And so we just kind of sat down and had a a discussion and I'm like, I want my own podcast. I want you included, but I want it to be mine. And so it just kind of, it took a while and we finally got to a point where I felt like I was ready to do it solo because I'm not the kind of person who can just sit here and talk and gab and all that. I like having a, a conversation with people. And so I finally got to a point I was ready to do it. And I'll tell you the story behind my, my name, Just Do You, because it's, it's really cute. Um, one night I was in the bedroom with my husband and we were talking about sex. And so I was like, so we're very, very active. Okay. So like daily, every other day type thing. Right on. And I just was really hungry and I'm like, okay, this is like two and three times a day, honey. Is this getting to be too much for you? And he looked at me, he goes, babe, just do you. And it really stuck with me. And the next several days, like I couldn't let go of that comment. And it just helped me to, to think about everything I was working on and where I wanted to go with my life. And it's to help women realize it's okay to be you. It's okay to not fit into the norm. Um, there are just so many times as women, we compare ourselves to other people, to what they, you know, how they dress, how they look like, what they're doing in life, their kids. And you just got to stop doing that and just be okay with who you are. So my podcast just kind of turned into that and it's been a great ride and it has been so much fun. That is, don't you just love it? I love the stories. I love the connection. It's, it's really so much different than I imagine it would be in the beginning. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, you guys started out in a certain way and went a different direction. It's just really interesting. It's not what you expect. No. Uh-uh. So the blog is there and I'm, we can yes. totally talk about sex as much as you want. It's like my favorite topic. <laughs> right. <laughs> Especially for women who somehow I, I feel like the social norm for sexuality with women is that the guy wants it and we have a headache. 
And <laughs> if we have sex, we know, oh, we're good for like another week or two. We can put it off. And I think, my God, what are you not doing right? That that's how yeah. you felt. Yeah. You know, with my ex-husband, um, a horrible dysfunctional relationship, I could go months. And when I would finally give in, it was because he was being so cruel and I'd give in. And so it's like, I've had both extremes. I've had like going months without, and then with my husband now, it's like every day, every other day or so. Yeah. So let's let's jump into your story because that's, that's, I, I already know sex is going to come up in functional and dysfunctional ways in our conversation. So take me back to growing up and, and that sort of thing. You know, for the longest time, I thought I had a normal childhood, um, which sounds funny as I get into it, but I really did. I thought I had a normal childhood. I thought my family was very functional. Um, and it was like, I'm grateful for this. But then as I got older and I started going to counseling because my, my oldest daughter, who at the time was um, 15, I believe she was, um, she was really struggling, had a lot of suicidal thoughts, um, attempted suicide four times, attempted suicide four times. And so as I started going to counseling with her, I started going to counseling on my own and it really brought up so much from my past. And I realized, and and this is going to sound funny, but I realized I had been molested, which is really weird because my whole life I've known exactly what happened, but it just didn't like click in my mind that that's what had happened. And when you've been there, you totally understand what I said. But um, yeah, through all this counseling I did, I realized I had been molested. And because of that, that situation, it really made sense why I was the way I was. Growing up, I was always into men. Um, I had to make them happy. I would do whatever it took to keep my boyfriend And I lost myself. I completely lost myself. So yeah, I just started realizing that my family is very, very dysfunctional. And it's only been the last two years, I think. And so I grew up in this dysfunction and it really shaped who I was, how I was parenting, how I was being a wife, how I was as a woman. And so it took so much time to come out of that. I want to clarify the molestation and make sure I'm understanding exactly what you're saying. So you okay. remembered it and what happened and how it happened. You didn't connect that with being molested or that terminology or that it was dysfunctional. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that is common. Yeah. Yeah. And it had happened several times. I can remember five to six different situations. Um, And then something happened on the very last one. And I'm like, this is gross. And it stopped and it was done. And it was by a family member. Um, But I just never realized that wasn't normal because I was so young. Well, and you don't know what you don't know. I mean, kids are, are really brave in a lot of ways, but they're also really trusting in a lot of ways, which, I mean, isn't that a beautiful way to be? Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, you want to be trusting. And so when an adult tells you to do something or asks you to do something, you tend to listen and think that whatever's happened is okay. Not only that, you don't have anything to compare it to. Yeah. Until much later when you realize, wait a minute, that was gross and it was wrong. Mm-hmm. And it had this impact. So. Yeah. So you're dating and how early on did you realize you started to want the attention of men? I mean, I know we're going to talk about your first pregnancy and that whole situation, but when, when did you really start trying to get attention? Cause you were about six when you were molested, right? Yeah, I was right around six years old. Um, I would guess about 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like, I wanted to have boyfriends. I thought they were all cute. Um, anything I could do to be friends with those boys. So it was about 12 years old that I I can look back and notice that's when I started looking for that attention. Well, that attention feels good. Yeah, it does. 
And from, from working with teenagers who have been molested and sexually abused and even sex trafficked, I mean, first of all, sex feels good. You know, there's a point where it feels good and the attention feels good. And so I know that sometimes people who don't understand are appalled. And I think, well, you don't understand. I mean, this, all of it feels good. It may not emotionally be appropriate, but it sure feels good. It does. And, you know, like with me, um, everything really changed at 15, um, where I met a man um, and he was a man. I was 15. He was 32, um, which ended up being the father of two of my children. And I thought I was in love. And it was like, I'm getting all this attention and it felt so good. I just wanted the attention. I wanted to be accepted. And I thought that's what I was getting. But looking back, it's like, it was so dysfunctional, obviously, but it was very, very emotionally abusive. It was never physically, but it was emotionally abusive the whole time. And it really, um, it kind of shaped because I was so young, it shaped my view on relationships and it's okay to be treated this way. That's how life is. Well, it was your only normal, right? Yeah. Cause that was my first quote unquote serious relationship. I had other boyfriends, but that was the first one where it was like, I'm in love. I want to be with him forever. Don't you think as a 15 year old girl, the older man thing, it's like, oh, he's mature and he wants me. And so aren't you great at 15? You're so advanced and beyond your years because it's older. I mean, because you don't see it from any other perspective when you're that age. Did you feel that way? I did. And I had always thought I was more mature than the other girls. Um, I didn't fit in with them. And so for me, it was like, well, I'm just older. I'm more mature. I can handle this. I know what I'm doing. But in actuality, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> you know, I'm a 15-year-old child. How did you meet? So I was at my best friend's house. And we were just outside hanging out. And there was this guy next door. And he was a, um, a cable guy. And we just started talking and he left and whatever. And then I think it was a couple weeks later or so, um, my friend and I were on the phone and he came back and she's like, we started talking about him and she was like, oh, you should talk to him. And I'm like, yeah, he's kind of cute. And so she put him on the phone and it was just like this immature, flirtatious moment. And that was it. And then I was at her house again and come to find out he was friends with that neighbor. And so he would go over there every um, so often. And he was there one time when I was there and he's like, well, here's my phone number. And so it just kind of spiraled from there. Tell me well, you're in high school and you got pregnant. Yeah. I, um, you know, because I thought I was more mature. I'm like, I want a baby. I want someone to love me. And we had never used any protection. Um, and I ended up getting pregnant. And this is after he had went to prison for being with me. And he had been in there, I think a year or so, got out of prison. We hooked back up and I got pregnant. Holy cow. So wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I mean, I knew about part of this, but you're 15 and he's 32. How did someone find out and how did he end up going to prison? So... He would sneak in the house at night. We had a two-story house and I was babysitting my, my cousin and her mother would go to work at like four in the morning. So I would just sleep downstairs. That was my excuse. And he would just come in and nobody would know. And one night uh, we were asleep and my dad came downstairs and he saw the cable truck parked on the street in front of the um, side yard. And he's like, What's going on? Is someone breaking in, freaking out? And so he went upstairs, my dad did, and um, the man snuck out, let the screen door slam shut, and he took off. So, and then, you know, obviously it's, it's a, um, a cable truck, so the cable company knew who was driving it. Wow, so, so dad tracked him down and pressed charges. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have to say as a parent and you the same, good for dad. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. 
I was so mad at the time. I'm like, I love him. Why are you doing this? Why do you hate me so much? And looking back, if it was my child, I would do the same thing. So he goes to prison for statutory rape. Yeah. Is he listed as a sexual predator also? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's like big, that's big time. And he deserves to because you're 15. So he's in jail for a year. You guys keep touch in touch this whole time? No, we didn't have any way to keep in contact. Um, so we were 15. He got out sometime after I turned 16. And right before I, um, I turned 17, I ended up pregnant. And 16 is age of legal consent in many states. I don't know what state you were in, but yeah. In yeah, so states. he actually had a restraining order, or, sorry, the state had a restraining order against him. So he could not be near me because it would be a violation of probation or parole, sorry. And so um, every time we got caught together, he went back to prison. How many times did that happen? Um, He went back to jail, I would guess, three times because of other people. And the last time he got sent back, it was because of me. What were the other people? Same situation? Um, my mom sent him back, I think twice oh, and okay. then his parole officer, um, caught us one time. Okay. So it was all having to do with you. There wasn't another person. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I was like, yeah. holy cow, wait, <laughs> this is a, soap- <laughs> I mean, it kind of is a soap opera, but and yeah. the whole time you're probably, are you pissed? Do you think you belong together? Everything's mm-hmm. great. No one else has a clue. Yeah. Like there did, there came a point where I can't even believe I did this with my mother, but we went out to eat. And I looked at her and I said, I love him. Can't you just sign for us to get married? I want to be together with him. Like that takes some serious balls, you know? And she's like, no, he's too old for you. You're just a child. And so, yeah, that that was like a crazy, crazy moment. um, And it doesn't make any difference to me who you are. What the hell was he thinking? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I don't care who the 15 or 16 year old is. Yeah. Where is his head? This is insane. Yeah. Why in exactly. the world would you do this? Yeah. And that's something that I will never be able to understand because I don't have that mentality. So I don't know. It's just, it was such a crazy situation. Um, you know, and I did get to a point where we kind of lost contact for, so my two oldest kids are two and a half years apart. Um, and we kind of lost contact, contact for about that time. And we ended up getting back together again. And it just was this on and off thing until I was 23, I believe I was. So you did, you got pregnant at 16. So mm-hmm. you end up having the baby. You kept the baby clearly. Yeah. Okay. And is he back in prison? Yeah. Yeah. He was in and out. Um, and he went for other things too. Um, okay. So it wasn't all just me. Um, but he was in and out the whole time. We were on again, off again type thing. Um, and then when I was, I had my son and he got married and that still didn't keep us apart. Tells you what kind of man he is. Right. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. So I was 23 and I finally got to a point where I was realizing this is so dysfunctional and I deserve better than this. And I finally cut it off for good. Now you had two kids. Was he involved with the kids at all? Did you get any financial support? Because he's in prison all the time. Yeah, I didn't get a whole lot. It was very sporadic. Um, He had very little contact with them. Um, And since I was 24, I believe it is, he's had virtually zero contact with them. And my ex-husband actually adopted them. Um. Every once in a while, he'll give my kids a call. Um, but my oldest, like, she sees how dysfunctional he is. Yeah. The last time he reached out, which, which was a couple weeks ago, she was like, if you call me again, I'm getting a restraining order. So. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Okay. So you're 23 and you're like, no more, we're done. And then you just said, so you remarried. I did. How long after? And were you with other people in the interim or were you like holding out for this guy? 
Um, there were a few, a few people during that time, um, but not a whole lot. I, I had no self-esteem. I had no self-worth. And so when I finally called it off with him, I'm like, okay, I'm good. I'm healthy. I realized that was bad. I'm good to go now. Right. Oh, Cause wait. you don't got to do any work. <laughs> <laughs> so I met my ex-husband and you know, we met online and the very first time I met him in person, I opened my door and I looked at him and I just kind of stood there with like my jaw on the ground. And I thought, what the fuck did I get myself into? Like I was repulsed by the way he looked and I was like, oh shit. But I didn't have the self-confidence to realize I deserve better. And so I just stuck with him and we ended up getting married. Sounds insane, but I had that little self-confidence. No, I think that that's a great point to make and something that people need to understand. I think we manifest, when you have low confidence, self-esteem, we just manifest it in different ways. So as much as it's like, holy cow, well, I mean, it doesn't make it worse than anything else. It's just the way you manifested it. And tell me, with low self-esteem, did you fit like this description where you didn't want to be alone? You felt like you needed to make a relation, have a relationship. It like completed you. You, Mm -hmm. was there a codependency aspect to how you felt at that point? You know, I grew up Mormon. Um, and as you know, Mormons, they like to get married young and get married and have a family. And that's what life is all about. And so in my mind, I'm like, I'm 23 years old. Like, most of my friends from church, which I hadn't been active in church since I was 16, um, they were all getting married. And it's like, no one else is going to want me. So I might as well just get married and be like everyone else. And as much, like in this situation, it was like, I wanted to be able to tell people I'm married. I have a husband because I thought it was a status thing. But I hated when he was around. He was a truck driver, gone all the time. And so I enjoyed the times he was gone. And when he would come home, it was like, can you leave yet? So you like his personality or was it just the, his look or something? No, I didn't like his personality. I didn't like how he looked. Like the whole package was repulsive to me, but I didn't think I could do any better. So I settled. Well, and I was Mormon for 17 years, which is not Uh something I generally talk about. So I understand it doesn't mean that it's always a mind fuck, but it certainly can be that way. And there is status. I mean, and and not only is there status in being married, there's how people look at you for having children out of wedlock or young Mm -hmm. or being a single parent. So there's there's a lot of dynamic in a any really strict religion, there's a totally different dynamic in your self-esteem and in how you, how people view you or how you assume people view you. So I understand that. So you, how did, did you, did you ever tell him how, did he know? Does he know now? <laughs> how did he feel about, I mean, like you had sex cause there were more kids. He adopted yeah. your first two kids. So uh-huh. fill in the gaps for me a little bit. I don't. I don't know how he didn't know. Like I did, I left him two times prior to the last time. So I left three times. The first two times he just thought, I guess he was gone all the time. And so I wanted him home more. I have no idea what his thoughts were. Um, I don't like, I really don't know what was going through his mind. Um, I don't know how he couldn't tell that I wasn't attracted to him or that I didn't like him. Because when you're not intimate with somebody, not even just on a physical level, but on an emotional level, there's issues. And he just didn't get it, I guess. And even the last time that I left him, it was like he would be so mean because in the past he would be so mean to me. I'd be like, fine, I'll just get back together with you. But this last time when I didn't go back with him because I had gone through a lot of counseling he was shocked. And I just don't know how, when you look back through the whole, we were married, I think 
11 years. When you look back through that span of time, how can you not see the dysfunction? You had the guts, the moxie to leave him. Did you go back for the same reasons? You didn't feel like you deserved anything better or no one, what? Because you have the guts to leave, but then you go back. So why, yeah. how'd you have the guts to leave? And then why did you go back? Um, I think I went back because it was like, he, he would be so mean. He would just kind of like, almost like beat me down emotionally. And I would just cave fine, whatever you want. Um, that's the only, that's the only way I can explain it really is he just kind of beat me down and I'm like, fine, whatever, I'll go back. So same with your sex life, because you mentioned that in yeah. the beginning. It's like after a while, you just give in to be left alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you also mentioned that you liked the fact that he was gone so much of the time. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you have to be married for the status part of it, and he adopted your kids, was that a good situation? You know, I thought it was at the time, because they got it got them away from their biological father. And he... I mean, it's just horrible, completely dysfunctional. And so I thought that it was going to be a good thing. But the whole time we were together, he never ever really accepted them as his own. They, he always treated them differently than the other two kids that we had together. Um, you know, and even now it's like my oldest two kids call him by his first name. They have zero um, relationship with him. Because he never wanted to build that. It was always about me. You know, and we would have all these arguments. And he's like, why don't you communicate with me about the kids? Like how their day was, you know? And I'd be like, how about you ask them? Show them that you care. And he took it as, I didn't want to communicate with him. And so he had never really built that relationship. And so they have no relationship even now. It sounds like it was better or more beneficial on paper and to just exclude mm -hmm. the worst of two evils. Yeah. Kind of tidy up, <laughs> tidy yeah. up the, the past a little bit. Um, and that's a shame because, you know, most, a lot of people don't want to adopt or don't feel comfortable or don't feel that connection. I mean, he still did it, which is yeah. kind of surprising. Right. But like in my mind, why would you do an adoption if, emotionally you weren't invested it, you're taking on financial responsibility and legal responsibility it's like a nice thing to do I guess but it's there's a lot you're taking on by doing that yeah. it just doesn't make sense but that's his story yeah so he adopted and you had two more kids and yes. you left twice you went back so you kind of allowed yourself to just be beaten down mm -hmm. and then you mentioned that you did not go back a third time because you'd had, had therapy. So I'm guessing he's still gone a lot. You've left him twice. What made you yeah. take the next steps? So, you know, my oldest, um, like I said, she had had a lot of issues with suicide and she had been going to counseling. I'd been going to counseling and I worked through almost all of the issues I had with self-esteem, with um, the older two kids as biological father, with being molested. I had worked through that and I got to a point where it was like, I deserve better. Like, even if I'm alone, that's better than being in this relationship. And so I had gotten a job and I was working from home and um, I got to be really careful with what I say with all that. But it gave me the opportunity to move to California and I'm like, okay, cool. This gives us some distance. We'll see how it goes. I moved out to California with um, the three, three of the kids. The um, oldest was living on her own. And we moved to California. And as I left Texas, I just broke down crying. And I'm like, I'm glad to be leaving Texas. Like, what is going on? And I realized that for the first time in my whole life, I felt free. And it was a feeling that I really hung on to because I had never felt free before. And so moved to California and very, very quickly, it was within a matter of like two, three weeks. I'm like, I'm done. I am not doing this. I'm away from you. I can support myself and the kids. I'm done. And that was the end. 
I think one of the biggest things, especially with three kids, even and four, even though one's moved out, is that financial concern. Yeah. So yeah. that's a, that's a great that you felt comfortable with that. And so you completely started your life over and he was still surprised. Was he surprised you moved or that you just wouldn't come back or? He was surprised that I wouldn't come back because I guess he assumed that I would come back like every other time. And when I didn't, he was like, what the hell? And his whole personality, because the whole marriage, even my parents, they didn't understand how he really was. And then after this time of me leaving, they were like, he's an ass. Like, what, what have you been dealing with this whole time? And they felt really bad because they never supported me in leaving him prior. And so they started seeing texts that he was sending me. They would listen to phone calls and they were like, we support you. Like this dude's crazy. Where were they living? So they were in um, Washington uh, okay. where I had grown up, but they had come down because my oldest daughter was getting married and she was getting married in California. And so they were down quite a bit um, getting ready for the wedding and then the wedding happening. That so, is awesome. I mean, that's, yeah. it, isn't it nice even after that time? And I mean, clearly you're, you're not the same religion anymore. Mm -hmm. This is your second marriage. It's been a little crazy and dysfunctional. I get that they're supporting you staying together and working it out because I, I feel the same way and I've been divorced. Yeah. And so I think you do everything you can and make it work and are accountable for your own stuff before you just walk away. So I, yeah. I don't know that I would give, I think I would back my kids in a different way than you were backed up. But I mean, I would give some similar advice probably as would you. Yeah. Without knowing the full story. Yeah. But what was it like to suddenly have their support after so many years? It was such a, a breath of fresh air. It's like, I felt validated. Every other time it was like, I felt like this child who was doing something wrong. And for the first time, it was like, they supported me in leaving him. And I was like, you see, like, I'm not just full of it. He really is this way. And so it was just so much validation for me. Um, and so nice to have their support for once. So. I'm so thankful for that. That's great when it comes back around. Because like you said, you didn't think you had a bad childhood. And maybe parents were totally yeah. fine. I mean, there's nothing, you know. But to kind of not have that and then have that, especially after all of that. I mean, situations, as you know, with teenagers can be a little traumatic. Yeah. For the teenagers <laughs> and the parents. I, I've been a little traumatized over some of the stuff my kids have gone through uh, yes. um, just from a parenting aspect. So to just come back together from that is really, that's amazing. Where in therapy, I know you go through therapy, you really talk about the molestation, the first marriage. At some point in your self-esteem, we all have to face the issue that we're still doing the choosing. Yes. So, I always feel like, well, I'm, I married a couple of good men that were really not good for me. Mm -hmm. They weren't innately bad people, you know, at all, but we weren't a good combination. And even if I had nothing that I did quote wrong in the marriage, you may not have anything you did wrong in the marriage. You still chose the person. Yes. <laughs> even if that was the downfall. So take me through a little of that. Was that in a the therapy when you were married or was that later? So when I was going to therapy, um, I had two really distinct moments. One of them was when I realized I had to forgive the man. I had to forgive him. And I was like, I didn't do anything wrong. He was the adult. I was a child. But I still chose. I still allowed it to happen because it's not like he was sitting there raping me. You know, I was allowing it to happen. And so I realized I had to forgive him. And it was so profound. It was like, oh. Never even thought that. And then it was a week later that I was sitting there waiting for my daughter while she was in therapy. And I just had this overwhelming feeling that brought me to tears. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? Examine my feelings. And I realized I needed to forgive myself because I had allowed all this stuff to happen. You know, I allowed everything with that man to happen. I chose to marry my ex-husband. I chose to stay in the relationship. 
I could have stopped all of this at any point in time and I chose not to. So it's on me too. So I just took some time and I really got to the root of everything that was going on and truly forgave myself. And without that and accepting responsibility, I could not be where I am today. I actually feel like I've always felt like forgiving yourself because I think about being molested, you know, Mm -hmm. and you're a little kid that's not doing anything wrong and you're listening to an adult, even though you feel like it's not right or maybe say something and like you did and it, and it ended, but the issue still comes back to you feel shame and guilt Mm -hmm. for somehow, even if there's no possible way logically, you know, that you did anything you still need to forgive that little girl. You still need yeah. to go back and for, and that's, I mean, that's a situation when you're six and you get molested, you haven't done anything. There's yeah, not a exactly. damn thing you could do, yeah. but forgiving yourself. I mean, you can forgive the person. You can even not forgive the person, but you have to forgive yourself. I don't think you can move forward yeah. without that. And yeah. then you have to figure out what the pattern is and how to choose differently. So what was that part like? That was hard. And that only came out during counseling when I realized all of my dysfunction stemmed from being molested as a child. Um, And so I just had to deal with that, accept what happened, forgive myself. And then I could start working on everything that happened after that. It wasn't an easy process and it's not something that happened overnight. I went through, I don't know, two years of counseling And it took probably a year. But once I was able to have that forgiveness, then I could move forward. Tell me how you and your husband met. So we actually met online. Mm -hmm. Um, Something my mother told me not to do again um, (laughs) because I saw how it worked out. So still to this day, I don't know if she knows we met online. (laughs) Surprise, mom. Right? But we met online and we, um, we really took it slow. We didn't even meet for about a month. That's funny that I say we took it slow because we really moved quite fast. Um, but we, um, we met online. We spoke for about a month on the phone every day, multiple times a day. And there was just something with him that clicked and it felt right. We understood what each other did for work. Um, He worked in a treatment center with boys um, who had been taken out of their homes. And I was working with youth who had been abused, raped, neglected, and I was working with them. And so we really got each other. And so when I was having a bad day because I had been dealing with a, a youth, I could go to him and be like, this is what's happening. This is why I'm struggling. He'd be like, I get it. And he could give this advice that was so good. And there were times he would just listen. And that's what I needed in the moment. And so we met and we really clicked. And we finally went on a first date. <clears throat> and it almost didn't happen. Um, I had been working and we were getting ready to have summer camp. And there was no way I could go down the mountain and meet him like an hour away. And so I'm like, can you just come up here? He's like, okay. And he almost didn't show up because I had changed the plans and he called me or texted me and said, let's just do this another time. And I was at the place in my life. I didn't need a man. I wanted to have someone to have fun with, but I didn't need a man. And so I was like, that's fine, whatever, but tell me why. And so he just kind of sat there and thought for a little bit. He goes, I'll be there soon. And then we had our first date, second date, we were in love and three months later, we moved in together. So <laughs> sometimes that's how it happens. Yeah. Now but, you you guys haven't had kids together. No, and we're not going to. Um, we're, you know, I'm 39. He's 38. So we're beyond that stage. Um, but he has one daughter, and she lives with us, and we've just kind of meshed like the Brady Bunch. So. Your kids, what's the difference in the relationship your kids have with him comparatively? I mean, I know they don't have much of a relationship with the other two, but th- do they actually have a relationship? Is it good? Neutral? Yeah. yeah. So you would, even with um, his daughter, 
you would like, she actually looks like me. Um, you would never know she's not my biological child. And it's the same with my four kids. The oldest, not so much because she's never lived here. Um, she lives six hours away. So they've never had time to build that relationship. But the other three kids look at him like their father. So, and even, you know, two of them have a better relationship with him than their own father. Which isn't so, surprising. No, not at all. But it's so, great because blending families yeah. is really difficult. Oh my gosh. It is so hard sometimes. But with us, it's like it was meant to be from the beginning. And it has been so easy. And I never, like, I just never thought it would be so easy. I thought it would be difficult. And it hasn't been. That's amazing. I mean, raising kids is difficult. Blending families is difficult. Doing all of them, you know, having teenagers is difficult. So when you're doing all of it, there's definitely never a dull moment. But um, I hear what you're saying about that for sure. Yeah. So, and it's been good because he has been the father that my kids have never had. They've never experienced a father who truly cares. Like, I mean, their father loves them to the best of his ability, but he's not the kind of person who let's go outside and play a game. Let's sit down and talk. Let's go do this. They've never had that. And with Tim, he truly cares about them. And if they're going through something and struggling, he wants to help them. Where the other kids with their father, or the kids with their, their father, it's like, one of my, my son um, kind of jokes around and says how his father tells him, if you're dealing with something, if you're depressed about something, put it in a nice little ball and just throw it out and you'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. That's reality, right? Where with us, it's like, let's talk about it. Let's get to the root of the issue and deal with it. At what point did you guys stop working with the at-risk youth? and? Was just out of curiosity, was his background similar with relationships? Because most, yeah. I mean, some people just want to work with at, use, at, at risk youth because they want to, but most people, there's a reason that yeah. launches it. Yeah. So with him, he grew up in complete dysfunction, makes my life look like a piece of cake, you know? Um, but, you know, both of his parents were addicted to um, drugs died of drugs um, from overdoses. Most of his siblings are in and out of prison because of drugs, um, lots of physical abuse. And so he got it and he wanted to help other kids. And so that's why he got into it. Um, and even now it's still a passion of his. He works with, with men now. Um, that way he can work with the husbands, the fathers, and that they can help the kids. But yeah, so we actually got out of this a year and a half ago, I believe it is now, maybe two years. Um, and it was just, we moved from California to Idaho because of work. We worked with the same company and we, it was a nonprofit, but then, you know, nonprofits are really, really difficult. And so we started a business to fund the, the nonprofit. And the business was managing podcasts. So we got into podcasting. It's been just over two years now. Um, and that's how all the podcasting stuff started. And then we, um, back in November, left the nonprofit, left that business and started our own business. Wow. Isn't it crazy how things, there's a movie called Mr. Destiny. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. But it talks about how one decision leads to another, leads to yep. another, and it's that progression. And if in some part of your life you make a different choice, the trajectory is completely altered. And so yeah. I always love that when, when you start seeing those points that it goes. So, yeah. I mean, you, you started the podcast itself be, to fund the nonprofit or the business helping podcast? the business helping other people with their podcasts. Okay. And then that split off completely. You guys went in a totally mm -hmm. different direction. Right. But still yeah. working to help people. That's crazy. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's funny that you were just mentioning, like you can find points in your life. Yeah. So I'll tell you mine and it is insane. Cause I would literally not be here today, 
but my daughter, you know, I'd said she struggled with suicide. She reached out to somebody who was the founder of the nonprofit. So we worked with him, with her, and then I started being his assistant and then his office manager. And then he gave me the courage to leave my ex-husband. And I came to California because I was in California. I met my husband and we got together and then we moved to Idaho because that's where the founder had moved to. And it was here that we branched off and went our separate ways, but we wouldn't be living in Idaho. We wouldn't have our business. I wouldn't be podcasting. I wouldn't have my husband. I wouldn't have his daughter. Like very, very specific points to get me where I am today. I love that retrospection. I, a lot of people talk about not looking back. And I think that looking back at the bad stuff shows you, you know, when you have something negative, like being molested, shows mm-hmm. you how much of a difference can be made in yourself. And then you can turn around and perpetuate that positive cycle with other people if you look back and take stock of where you've come yeah. from. But it also shows you those points where your trajectory may have been so completely different and you're so thankful. Or I love when people, because I'm slightly like this, I'm slightly <laughs> goal oriented in OCD, like this is what's going to happen and this is my, <laughs> yeah. so I'm not type A, but I could be if I tried a little bit. And you know, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen like you have it all mapped out. You think it's going to yep. be a straight line and it's more like a curvy mountain road. Yep. And it was so much better than you ever imagined. So I love, I love when people look back. I think that that's important. Well, and it can also show you how far you've come in life because Mm -hmm. I can look back to 32 years old and be like, wow, I was so broken. And, you know, if there's any point in time, right, you know, in the present where I'm struggling maybe with um, self-worth, confidence, whatever it is, I can look back and be like, but I used to be there. Look at how far I've come. Yes. So I love when you can use that. So I, I want to ask you another question because it's come up a couple times. This is something that I've been asked a few times because our backgrounds are, are there's a couple similarities. How do you go from a kid who's molested and having very dysfunctional sexual relationships to having a healthy sex life? You know, it, it really did happen naturally. Um, when I left my ex-husband, I didn't know that you could have a happy relationship. I didn't know it could be, you know, healthy. And so when Tim and I, I met, I'm like, I'm going to be intentional. I want to have a healthy sex life. I want to have a healthy relationship. I want to be the kind of wife who I would see other people at church and the man would have his arm around his wife. And I used to think they were like bullshitting and like pretending. No, there's really relationships like that. And that's what I wanted. And so I just made it very intentional. So when we first got together, I'd walk behind him and I'd put my hand on his back. Or I would leave for a little bit. I'd make sure I kissed him before I left and when I got back. So it was just very intentional actions that built the relationship that we have now. Was he the same way? Or did you, were you verbal about that? You know, I don't, I don't remember. Um, he had a lot of dysfunction um, at the end of his marriage, um, but I don't, I don't remember noticing it. I think he said in the past that he did, but I didn't recognize it because I looked at him as if he was so much further progressed than I had, and I was like, I just want to be like him, and so I don't know if he felt that way. Sometimes I know the things that are really important to me when you're divorced and you know, you really know what you want and you don't want to settle and you want that genuine, your arms around me. Yeah. Like if you like me and yeah. you do that, yeah, we're not pretending because we're in public sort of, you want the real deal, right? I knew yeah. what things were important to me. And so I was verbally expressive about them. Like I'm a super affectionate person, but don't be yeah. clingy. You know, I <laughs> you don't cross that creepy line, but, right. but you know, I mean, there were things that I wanted that were important to me in a relationship period. So I was vocal. And so I was wondering if you were vocal about those intentions to set that relationship up the same way. Like for me, it's a date night. 
that's one of the big ones. Yeah. Like, yes. <laughs> see, we react the same way. And part of that's having kids. And part of that's just anything you do when you're single and dating someone, those are the things that you should continue to do. So ladies, yeah. shave your legs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, blow dry your hair. Every, not every time maybe, but you know, there's, there's little extra things that we do to get the guy but not to maintain the relationship. And that was always confusing to me. So I was verbally very intentional. Yeah. And we've been like that. We're big talkers. Um, okay. We talk all the time. And so if there's something that I need, like there got to a point where date night had kind of went to the wayside and it wasn't happening. And I, I got to a point, I'm like, I need date night back. And I was just very blunt. This is what I need. And so we're both like that. If there's something we need from each other, we say it. We don't do the whole BS game of, I want him to guess what I'm thinking or what do you think? And I, we don't play those stupid games. If there's something that we need, we just express it. Which is really how it should be. But that's why I asked you about being verbal because when you've come yeah. from dysfunctional relationships and you're starting a new one, you can't guess. Yeah. Yeah. And in the beginning, it was so difficult. It was really difficult for both of us because his past was like, I get pissed off. I'm just going to go and I'm going to like be on my own. Don't talk to me. Stay away from me type thing. And the first time that happened, I'm the opposite. I want to talk. I'm going to talk it to death. And I'm like, I just want to talk. And he wanted nothing to do with me and was ignoring me. And so we really talked about that and we're like, I can't have you like this. And he's like, well, I need time. And so we had to work it out. So, and it took time and, you know, we're constantly getting better, but it just really helps when you have that communication. Oh yeah. I know. I was joking with one of my girls the other day because she borrowed my car. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, there's this new thing called communication. I thought maybe we could try it out. She's like, Oh my gosh, I just read an article about that. I oh mean, my gosh. I don't think it'll work, but we, you know, I mean, yeah. So I like to joke about it a lot because all you have to do is let me know. Yeah. I mean, it really isn't hard because miscommunication or no communication is going to end badly like a hundred percent of the time. That's awesome. And it's great that like, because I know Anything with intimacy, which is the date night, which is the talking, which is sex, which is emotional support, those things are really hard when it's been dysfunctional in the past and you really want it to be better. Yeah. So it's good that for you guys, it just kind of happened naturally and you had to hash out a couple things. Yeah. Which is normal and it's to be expected, but we've just been very, very intentional. That's good. Yeah. Tell me about the new website. That's launching. Can you tell me anything about it? So it's kind of a little bit on the back burner. Um, okay. I keep thinking about it, um, but right now we're redoing our um, our podcasting website for our business. Um, I've been working on that all day long, so I have a fried brain. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to kind of have different resources there, and I don't know if I'll end up moving my blog over. Um, I don't know. Ah, my website's been down for a month. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I cried. Yeah. You have, you have moments, you know, and then you're like, oh yeah, yes, yeah, it's gotta be all right. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So. so you have new things percolating on the back burner, but the, po so yes. for podcasters out there, cause there's a lot of them, mm -hmm. you are the resource. So I'll make sure yeah. that we put as much of that information in the uh, show notes. Oh, awesome. Um, Yes, I'm making notes to myself for my notes in the show notes. I do that all the time. I think that's amazing. And it's crazy that it started out the way it did. Are you guys still yeah. on good terms with the person that was the director of the nonprofit? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So bad. It's going to be like a happy honeymoon <laughs> store, Cinderella. No. Okay. No, no. We, um, he was like a brother to me. His wife was my best friend. My husband and him were becoming best friends. And we started seeing a lot of um, bad stuff, a lot of very unethical things happening, and we didn't want to be a part of that. And because of that, we pulled back, and it just got really, really nasty. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, that wasn't yeah. a happy ending. So let's end on right? that happy. <laughs> 
<laughs> people can read all of the, you have, you have a great blog. You have lots of posts about all kinds of different things. Um, where's the easiest place to find you? And what would you end on advice for people really struggling with self-esteem? Um, I think people who are struggling with self-esteem, I would tell them just to kind of give yourself a break. We all, I don't care who we are, we all have self-esteem issues. Um, but just give yourself a break. And if there's some reoccurring, um, whether it's body image, whether it's self-worth, whatever it is, find the root issue of it and deal with that. Because until you deal with the root issue, you're never going to get any better. You're never going to overcome your issues. Awesome. How can people yes. find you the easiest? So I am on Instagram and Facebook a lot. Um, on Instagram, I'm Just Do You Podcast. And on Facebook, that name was taken. So I'm Just Do You 2019. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie. It was such a pleasure having you on. Oh, thank you. It was so great. Thank you for taking the time to get naked with us. If you'd like to bear it all with me, get in touch. Your story is unique and valuable. Let's show it off.